Hey there, good afternoon, or I guess good evening. Oh. How was your weekend? It was pretty good. How about you? Great. Uh, hung out with a friend on Saturday, so had some vague semblance of a social life. Uh, <laughs> goes far these days. Yeah. All right, I'll just give it a couple more minutes. A couple of people said that they were going to be running a few seconds late. Uh, I guess before I get started, does anyone have any burning questions about fixed income or rates products that they'd like me to touch on? If you'd rather do it anonymously, feel free to send them in the chat as well. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> uh, I guess, obviously, if anything arises, just shoot me a message or interrupt me at any point. I don't think this will go for an entire hour unless you guys have a lot of questions, and hopefully you guys do. Uh, I probably have 20 prepared slides that go into quite a bit of detail. But uh, as always, if there's any questions, please do let me know. But with that in mind, if everyone's okay, I will turn on the recording. Perfect. Well, welcome everyone. Good evening. Today is Sunday, September 13th, and we're going to cover rates and credit products, which is a very interesting area that spans quite a bit of the sell side bank operations in sales and trading, and is also a big product on the buy side. So let's start from the very beginning and take a broad viewpoint. We need to look at the difference between debt and equity, which we can construe as the difference between bonds and stocks. So stocks represent an equity investment in a company, which means, as you can see on the right, the bottom of the capital structure. Oh, sorry. Thank you. All right, can you see now? Looks like it, okay. I can see it. Perfect, thank you. Well, I guess just to start off, we'll see the difference between debt and equity. We need to look at stocks as being an equity instrument, which means there's gonna be a higher risk, which also means that they earn a higher risk premium, which means basically, in theory, you're gonna get paid more for taking on this additional risk. Corporates issue equity, and the shareholders are the owners of the company and the form of the returns or the profit earned by the company paid in the form of dividends. Obviously, you also have the appreciation if you later sell a stock that you've bought at a lower price. The major risks that you have here are the market risk and the business risk. Obviously, this is a mi very micro investment because you are choosing a specific company to invest in because you believe in the thesis that that company is presenting. You think that in the future, it's going to be worth more or that you're gonna earn a lot of dividends along the way. And a place that you oftentimes see very high dividends are in places that have a lot of free cash. So you'd see things like, uh, I guess, the easiest example is an advisory investment bank. They like to give a lot back in dividends. We see REITs, which are real estate investment trusts, real estate debt funds. They give huge amounts of their funds back in the form of dividends back to shareholders. In addition, when you do have equity, you are a shareholder, which means you do get the right to vote, which is uh, very interesting as well. Considering bonds, bonds are obviously a debt instrument like a loan. However, unlike a loan, they are unsecured. Uh, loans would be something that a bank would do, usually on a secured basis where there's collateral. So if something goes wrong and your loan is a mortgage, then they can take your house. So they have the ability to take that collateral. To move on, we see that bonds can be issued by governments, uh, financial institutions, and corporates. They can also be issued by sovereigns. There's a huge broad array of people that can issue these instruments, unlike uh, stocks, which are just for corporates. 
In addition, these major risks that you're going to look to are the interest rate risk and the inflation risk because you do have a predetermined coupon rate that you know that you're going to get, or you have a floating rate bond, which is not on the fixed basis like that. But for a floating rate bond, you'll get quoted as a LIBOR plus spread, or now it'll be a SOFR plus a spread, the secured overnight financing rate, which is going to replace LIBOR, which is the London Interbank Offered Rate. What's a floating rate bond? Uh, sorry, say that one more time. A floating rate bond? So a floating rate bond is instead of having a coupon where, say, it's an Apple bond, so it's a 1% coupon, you don't know what that coupon is going to be. So when you have that 1% coupon, the problem becomes if market rates change a lot, and rates go up a lot now your real let's say inflation rises a lot now your real amount that you're receiving is so much lower because the inflation has risen oh, With, yeah, sorry say that one more time are floating rate bonds um like do they rise and fall with the interest rate yeah exactly so the spread amount is constant so it's LIBOR plus a spread and the spread is constant, so it's LIBOR plus 100, and it's always going to be 100 basis points over what LIBOR is. Okay, thanks. So LIBOR will move, but something that's really interesting that does come into play is that you have these things called LIBOR floors, which is the bottom of the, like, the minimum value that you can get from that LIBOR piece. So far also can have floors. So typically we see LIBOR right now trading 24 basis points, or I guess can't say trading because it's not a market rate, but the rate for LIBOR is 24 basis points, which is really, really low. And if you look to, uh, I guess, just pre-COVID crisis, seven months ago, eight months ago, we would see LIBOR trading the mid 100s, like 150. So that huge discrepancy has come into play because a lot of contracts have LIBOR floors, which means that if LIBOR falls below 1%, which is where they typically are, which is 100 basis points, then it just defaults to being 100. So it's like the minimum function, I'm sorry, the maximum function of either 100 or whatever the basis points are on LIBOR at the moment. Wait, how come they're using LIBOR? Isn't that like strictly UK based? So LIBOR is created, so there's US dollar LIBOR, which is uh, LIBOR converted with FX into uh, US dollar rates, but it's actually the way that it's historically been calculated, which is one of the reasons that it's changing, is banks in London at 1130 in the morning make a phone call to say what their unsecured borrowing rate would be to each other on an insecure basis. So there's these huge scandals of LIBOR manipulation because these people can choose whatever rate they want to say and they have massive books of positions that are based on LIBOR. They do this thing called trimming to the mean where I do believe it's 24. I might be mistaken on the number that they currently use, but they trim to the mean. So instead of, I guess, picture four quartiles, they get rid of Q1 and Q4 and then average, I believe it is a mean average, because it's trimmed to mean, of those two middle quartiles. And so that second and third, to get rid of the skewing effect, uh, there's been a lot of major lawsuits because that doesn't necessarily really work. And again, people are biased and are able to pick whatever number they want. Uh, let's see, wait a second. Uh, can I enlarge it somehow? Yes, I can actually. Is that better? It's probably a lot better. Yeah. Awesome. Um, does that answer it? So it's a US dollar quoted rate, but it's by London banks. I see, okay. But like why London specifically instead of like, uh, like Hong Kong or Japan? I don't know why it was chosen. I mean, it's been that way since the seventies. They are switching to the SOFA rate uh, all over in every market. So you'll have different versions of that internationally where you have Sonya, um, you'll have, uh, I forget what they're called in other markets, but in the US it'll be SOFR, in other markets it'll be Sonya, it will not be LIBOR because there's a couple hundred trillion dollars of transactions, notional value that sit on LIBOR right now. And LIBOR is not a market rate. So why on earth is it in LIBOR? which is the question and which is why it's changing. And the answer that, oh, it historically was, so it'll always be, is not up to par anymore. So we see this switch to SOFR. Problem with SOFR is SOFR is so low. So it's trading between, last time I looked, it's trading around six basis points. So it's incredibly low in a very different, 
I, I mean, it's not necessarily bad. The question just becomes how stable is it going to be because it's based on secured borrowing costs is definitely linked to, I don't know if you followed the repo crisis of last October, but repo rates in, uh, I guess, through the New York Fed spiked up to whatever, 1,200 basis points, a little over 12%, or it was somewhere in the four digit range in basis points, which is incredibly, incredibly high because for secured borrowing overnight, it should be super low rates. So we saw this massive spike, we saw this liquidity crisis in the repo market, and the question becomes, what's gonna happen to something like SOFR that's based on something comparable if we do have this backlog in the market? And there's a really good podcast that can explain it a thousand times better than I can that I'd love to um, uh, send to you that goes through the repo crisis, but that's one of the questions and concerns that people have with SOFR right now. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, perfect, will do. All right. Well, for the rest, um, rest of the stuff on the slide, I think it's pretty intuitive. Uh, just looking to the right, we see a capital structure of a corporate with secured debt at the top, which are bank loans. If a company is in bankruptcy above this bank loan, we'll probably see some sort of dip financing, which is debtor in possession, which is usually someone that was already in the capital structure that is now becoming super senior. We see other types of debt as well, where we do payment in kind notes, where you pay down debt by issuing new debt instead of, or pay down debt with securities instead of actual cash payments. We also see uh, convertibles, non-convertibles, callable bonds, which basically means that somebody can decide to take them out at par or with a make whole premium, depending on the type of bond it is. Moving down the capital structure, we see preferred equity, which can be convertible or non-convertible. The idea behind preferred equity is you have the upside of equity, but you also get some sort of structured payment along the way. You get some sort of coupon. Uh, and then obviously at the bottom, you have common equity and below that you have uh, rights and warrants, which are essentially options without those voting rights that you'd have if you actually own the equity in the company. So if there are no more questions, I'd love to move on. All good. All right, so within the world of debt, we have two main categories. We have bonds and we have loans. So bonds are, or I guess bonds and loans, to look at them both, are methods to get debt. They're ways to borrow money at a predetermined or not predetermined rate in different fashions. And the firm and the government will pay an annual interest rate or some sort of periodic interest rate payment on either of these. Big differences are that the interest rates on bonds are typically fixed. You'll see floating rates, especially for interest rate swaps. That's usually where you see floating rates. In addition, on the bond side, we see that the bonds can be sold on the open market to publics, uh, public people, um, financial institutions. We see a huge swath of different people that can buy bonds. However, on the loan side, especially uh, I guess, especially for broadly syndicated loans or just bank loans in general, they are held by banks. Usually banks keep them. Usually they're not sold early. And that does affect their ability to move in price with um, the interest rate markets and move in price because they're fixed. They're not, uh, they don't trade with a price. They're not sold to other people. They stay on a bank balance sheet. And then banks with their own balance sheet on the other side of the equation do some sort of hedging procedures to hedge that interest rate risk. Usually they'll intend on being duration neutral, DVO1 neutral, especially on the loan side where you have these predetermined liabilities. Within loans, uh, it's not on the slide, but I'd be remiss if I didn't share. There are two main types. You have your TLA and your TLB. TLAs amortize. When a loan amortizes, it means that you get your payments along the way. Instead of just having a coupon payment where you're just paying down that interest, you actually pay down parts of the principal at each payment when it amortizes. So that's a TLA. Uh, bank loans are typically TLAs and held in the balance sheets. In the higher yield market for riskier borrowers, you also have something called the TLB. A TLB is known as a term loan B. And in that, that does not amortize. You'll see that in these riskier companies. You'll see those also double leverage loans as well. Loans can be fixed rate, but they're also often variable. You can even see this with a mortgage. Uh, 
just for an easy example that a lot of people can uh, relate to. On the treasury bond side, we see a whole swath of different prices across the curve. We have bills, notes, and uh, longer dated bonds, which represent different parts of the term structure. So on the short end of the curve, we have those uh, shorter notes and then the notes in the middle and then the bonds all the way at the end, they go up to 30 year. There was question, uh, I guess in the US, sovereign bonds go up to 30 year. Corporate bonds are always uh, I guess typically a bit shorter, but honestly, they can be all over the place. The shorter duration bonds in the corporate space are a lot more liquid. Uh, just because of the demand there. The 10-year and 30-year treasuries in the U.S. are known to be risk-free or I guess dubbed risk-free. So usually in corporate finance, you'll discount, discount cash flows at this risk-free rate, which is oftentimes either the 10-year or 30-year bond, which like all rates right now are incredibly low. Uh, rates on bonds can be negative, which is something that you'll see in Europe, uh, seen in Japan for a while as well. So uh, these, in exchange for this additional safety on the government bonds, we see lower yields and we'll get into uh, capital structure or uh, credit ratings later and we'll see that application to corporate bonds as well. To put it in simple terms, bonds are financial assets or agreements in which the issuer is required and obliged to repay an investor an amount borrowed plus interest or in the case of sovereign bonds in negative yielding environments, it's going to be plus negative interest, which means the amount you're getting back is lower. We'll see that in disinflationary or sorry, deflationary environment as well. Disinflationary just means inflation still positive, but is falling. Uh, the zero lower bound in the U.S. Is there something specific about that? What do you mean by? I I, I just know that it means interest rates can't go below zero, but why in the US do we have that policy, whereas in Europe and Japan they don't? So they can. The thing is the Fed just doesn't want them to. They can, and real yields, which are indicated by the tips, are what, negative 90, negative 92 basis points right now. Where So a tip is a treasury inflation protected security, which is, it's a floating rate note that is moving with the inflation rate. They calculated in a different way using some variation of CPI. But the whole idea is you can get to something called the real yield as opposed to the nominal yield. So nominal yields are positive. Real yields are very negative. The um, futures on the FFR seem to indicate that we could have negative rates in the future. The Fed has said that they don't want to. Um, there's a whole host of problems that can come out of having negative interest rates. If you think about that, you are disincentivizing banks to give loans, which means you are making financial institutions, which exist for the very purpose of providing money into the economy, not want to give money into the economy. So the Fed is going to do what they can to keep it in that positive sphere. That being said, they like having low rates because low rates are stimulative, but going into the negative rate territory has not worked well historically for any country. Japan's been in this long run monetary experiment for a long time. And obviously Europe's in that negative territory right now too. Did that answer it? Or is there anything more I can share? No, that's perfect. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Moving on to the things on our right, we see key terms for, uh, bonds. If there's anything, I'll touch on a couple. If there are any that I don't say that stand out to you, please do let me know. In terms of issuers and borrowers, pretty intuitive. Principal, face, and par are all synonymous. Usually for a bond, you'll have, if it's issued at par, you'll have the price be 100, which means that was the issuing price, and it can trade either above par, like for a mortgage-backed security where you have prepayment risk, so it's going to trade above par, or you can trade below par where you're trading at a discount. So if it's above par, it's at a premium. If it's below par, it's at a discount. When you have callable bonds that have make whole premiums, you can see a lot of trading above par because once it gets to that make whole premium, they can take it out. So when a bond is called, to start from the nascent example, the idea is that they are ending the debt. The debt is over, they're gonna pay it all now and not have to worry about the future interest payments. Obviously, 
if you're doing that, then you're forgoing that interest that you would have accrued over those upcoming periods. With that in mind, there's a make whole premium. It can range, it's typically, uh, from what I've seen, it's probably five to 8%, which means like prices between 105 to 108. On munis, it can be like 102, but we'll have a make whole premium, which is the price at which the issuer, which is the company that issued it, can buy it out. Just uh, another key term is a basis point. A basis point is 10 to the negative fifth of a dollar. So it's 0.01%. It should be 10 to the negative fifth. It's what, one, to, uh, one over 10,000. So yeah, 10 to the negative fifth. Uh, most things are quoted in basis points just because it is so small. Yields are so small, especially in our current environment. Usually, like instead of saying LIBOR is 0.24%, I'll just say it's 24 basis points, and that's easier to communicate with market participants that way. In terms of yield, uh, I think we'll get to this later. There are a lot of different ways to calculate yield. The most important one is yield to maturity. That is your analyzed, annualized rate of return over the maturity. You can have uh, option adjusted versions of this. So you can have yield to call, which if things are trading at a, per at a premium, but there's a non-call per uh, period, then you can say that, okay, the issuer is probably gonna call this as soon as they can. So we're gonna quote this. Instead of using the full maturity, we're gonna use it on the short maturity. So something really interesting that oftentimes uses these callable bonds is, and I don't wanna get into too much detail on this now, but if you wanna do a little bit of research on the Formosa market for insurance companies, they hedge in different ways by hedging on yield to call instead of yield to maturity like you would in the US. So that's the Taiwanese insurance market, dubbed Formosa, which is very interesting to look into. But I think that pretty much covers it. If there are any questions, as always, please don't hesitate to let me know. All right, so to move to the breakdown of the fixed income space, we see three main categories. Firstly, we have rates. Rates are kind of dubbed cash, like sovereign bonds, derivatives if they're interest rate swaps and futures, or exotics if they're structured products that are based on rates, which means they're their swap shop, the swaptions, they're esoterics, they're basically anything that doesn't fit into the first two categories. It's not a vanilla derivative where I'm giving you a fixed rate and you're giving me a floating rate and I have debt that's cheaper for me to issue in floating rates, but I wanna have a fixed rate so I can hedge it easier on my books or uh, a govy, which is a cash um, equivalent, which is just a sovereign bond, which in very developed markets is basically risk-free. So we'll see US governments, which are the treasuries, you see JGBs, which are the Japanese government bonds. You see uh, in, in the UK, they have their pound denominated sterling debt as well. So you have these different categories within rates. On the credit side, we see things that are either investment grade, which are triple A through double, uh, oh, sorry, triple A through triple B minus, or high yield, which is double B plus to triple C. And these represent corporate bonds. Uh, with this in mind, you look to things like your interest coverage ratio, which is your EBITDA divided by interest expense, and your leverage ratio, which is your debt to EBITDA. There are a lot of different ways to calculate this. Obviously, EBITDA is a non-GAAP measure, so it's a proxy for free cash flow, but albeit just a proxy. With regard to debt, sometimes you'll see net debt, sometimes you'll see total debt, so you need to be careful and these are oftentimes used for covenants on debt. So when you issue, it's a really cup light environment right now, it's becoming a little bit less, but for probably everything post-crisis, at least from 2013 on, we've seen an incredibly borrower-friendly cup light environment. And the idea behind that is you have positive covenants and negative covenants. With positive covenants, this affirms things that you need to do. This is a must do, this is an affirmative covenant, a positive covenant, which says uh, we need you to do this. And for your negative covenants, it means you cannot do this. So your positive covenant can be, oh, we need an interest coverage ratio of at least four, or I guess more likely like at least 1.2, that would be a fair number. Or we need a leverage ratio of whatever number. For your 
uh, negative covenants, it means that you cannot do something. So something that you'd see is you cannot divest this asset. You cannot sell more than this much uh, of your real estate. You cannot sell this portion of your business. So we have covenants on both sides there. In addition, we'll have things like credit default swaps, which are derivatives contracts. I hope we'll have a lecture soon to get into a lot more detail there on credit derivative, uh, credit default swaps, but also on credit default swap indices. So you have your CDX as opposed to CDS. Uh, a quick thing to note is whenever you see something that ends in an X, it's probably an index, whether that's SPX, which is the S&P 500 index, the CDX, which is an index of CDS, your ABX, which is your asset-backed securities index. The X means index, S means single security usually. And on the right side of your screen, we'll see muni or public debt. These are issued by local governments. And the cool thing here, and the reason that they're incredibly popular, is that they can be triple tax exempt. So at the municipal level, at the state level, and at the federal level, we usually see things be taxed. But if you do live in that area and say, I am supporting a bond, I'm buying a bond for Florida, or I'm buying a bond for, I guess a better example would be for a specific county within Florida. I can get triple tax exemption because I'm a Florida resident. Uh, lots of ultra high net worth, which is the UHNW acronym, uh, which means it depends on the firm and how they classify it, but I think it's over $100 million of liquid net worth, typically. Uh, they like the short end of the curve because there's huge tax benefits. And obviously, if you're talking about numbers that big, it's a great way to get those tax benefits. In addition, insurance companies and retail investors like the longer end because going out further in duration, which is a theme you'll consistently see, means that you're probably going to get a higher yield. Obviously, these are munis, so the yields are going to be tiny anyways, but it's better to get a little bit more if you are able to extend your duration. Um, check. still no questions in chat. Okay. So to touch on bonds, we're going to first calculate the clean bond price here, and we'll get into the difference between the clean and the dirty bond prices soon. But, uh, the biggest thing that you should know about bonds is that there's an inverse relationship between price and yield. When prices rise, yields fall. When yields fall, uh, I guess when yields rise, prices fall. So when you see bonds quoted, someone will say, oh, this treasury rallied today and then you'll look up on your screen and see a red number next day yield and think that they're out of their mind. What do you mean they rallied? This yield is down. The idea is that these things are inversely related. So whenever the price goes up, the yield is going down. Uh, that's pretty much always true. Uh, I can't necessarily think of an exception off the top of my head. These are inversely related with a convex curve, which we'll touch on on convexity next. But biggest thing, inverse price and yield relationship. When you're quoting bonds, you have the spread, which is the bid ask spread, which is the difference between the ask price and the bid price. The dealer will buy at the bid and sell at the ask. Although, um, although they are uh, oftentimes quoted as yields on television when you're actually trading them. And we'll get into a little bit more technical details on the quoting procedures, but you usually quote the price at which you'll buy at the bid and the dealer will sell at the ask. Uh, on the right of your screen, you'll see a zero coupon bond value, which is just the discounted value. Uh, so you've got your cash flow that you are discounting at that rate, which is a simple formula. And for the clean bond price, the idea is pretty simple. You're taking the coupon over here, and then uh, this is semi-annual, so it's 2N. But the idea is that you're taking the coupon, discounting it every period, and then you are also adding that final bullet payment that you're going to get at the end. So as I uh, mentioned, we're going to talk about quoting prices. There's two prices that are quoted, the clean and the dirty. So the clean is the one that is actually quoted. People sell at the clean price. So the idea is that the clean price is calculated above. It's known as the flat price. The idea is it does not have accrued interest, which is a concept we'll get into next. But you've got your clean, which means flat, and your dirty, which means full. If you look to the right of your screen, you'll see an example where the bonds price is 102-04. What on earth does that mean? So the idea is this is the handle over here, the 102 handle. 
and on the right you'll see offering for so bonds uh, corporate bonds, most bonds are quoted in 30 seconds, especially in the US. Fixed income is an incredibly odd space because there are a lot of historical conventions and it wasn't decimalized until I think the turn of the millennia. So it's only been 20 years that it's been decimalized. So there's still all of these historical, uh, very strange conventions that are incredibly annoying to work with. But considering that they aren't quoted in 30 seconds for corporate bonds, we see four of a 32. So we see a 102 handle offering four, which means it's 102.125. So 102 and an eighth. Does that make sense to everyone? No. Okay. Yeah, not really. So what is the handle and what's the offering? So the handle is the 102 and the offering four is the number that you put over 32. So it's handle, plus offering divided by 32. Wait, what's the handle? The handle is the, so there's two parts to the price. You see there's the part before the decimal and the part after the decimal. So the part before the decimal is known as the handle. Usually you don't say the handle. So if I was trading a bond, I'd say, hey, I'm offering four. By this point, everybody knows, because the spreads aren't that wide, everybody knows that I'm talking about the 102 handle because that's near what the market price is. So I just say, Hey, I'm going to buy this offering four, which means 0.125. One oh, uh, the handle plus the offering is all just for one price or something like the clean price. This is one bond. This is one clean price. Okay. And um, usually people like keep the whole number the same and they change the handles. And that's like how you see like, oh, which one's a better deal? Uh, they keep the handle the same and then change the offering number. Yeah, so. Yeah, no, exactly. So you have your handle, which is the big number. And then here, so it's, it's one number. It's two parts, I guess, the part before the decimal and the part after. The part before the decimal is probably known because spreads aren't going to be that wide where I'm going to be off by an entire percent. I'm going to be off by 100 basis points. I mean, no, I'm not going to be off by 100 basis points mm -hmm. in terms of market participation. So because obviously there's a need for celerity as well, we just say, oh, offering four, which means four over 32. And this 32 is constant. It's a historical convention. It's always gonna be over 32, except for treasuries, which are annoying and odd as well, where treasuries, because they are so liquid, because they are so popular, are quoted as one over 64. So this still is, the 101 is gonna be the handle, dash 01 or dash one means one over 32. And then this plus right here means also plus one over 64. So you sum all of this and get the number. Does that make sense? It's very odd and should not exist, but I did not make it. <laughs> Is that better, John T? Yes, definitely, thank you. Okay, awesome. So to move on, we're gonna talk about the difference between clean and dirty prices. So accrued interest, which is an imperative concept here, is going to be added to the clean price to get to the dirty price. So the dirty price is essentially what it's actually worth. Um, so when you trade in the market, you trade at the clean price, but you have this accrued interest because if you look at this picture down here, and I think this is the easier way to look at it, you see you're accruing interest all the time, but you don't get paid that coupon payment until you get to that coupon date. So knowing that you have to wait until here to get the coupon, if I sell the bond here, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but if I sell it, whatever, a couple days before the interest payment date, I'm still going to be able to get this interest payment here. So I have all of this accrued interest that I don't have to wait for because someone else already waited for it when they own the bond. So you take the clean price, add the accrued interest, and that's how you're gonna to get to the dirty price. So the dirty price is gonna be what it's actually worth to you. When you transact in the market, you're gonna transact in the clean price though. So this is the formula for it. It's a lot easier for me just to think about it in terms of the picture. Obviously, when you hit this coupon date, this is gonna fall right back to zero. You lose all of your accrued interest when there is an interest payment because, because there's no more interest that's being accrued. It already has been accrued and then given in that payment. 
Does that make sense? So it's only the hypotenuse like of one of those triangles, not all, like not multiple. What do you mean? Sorry, say that one more time. So like you can only go up to like from well, just looking at the graph, like it, it, uh, you you get the pavement like every half, right? So you yeah. can only go from, like, zero to half, not like zero to one. For well, so once you get that coupon payment it's gonna go back to zero because you're accruing interest, which means someone else is holding the bond. And the longer that they hold it for, the closer you get to getting your coupon payment. I see. So yeah. wait, does it add it to the price, just like simple interest uh, for that part? Or does it like, yeah, does it affect the interest rate or like the coupon value? Does it affect the interest rate or the coupon value? It would affect the the dirty price. So it affects what is actually worth to you. I don't think, um, I mean, obviously it would change. So yield to maturity, the way that it's quoted in market is gonna be quoted based on the clean price. So mm -hmm. the, the rate is gonna be based on the clean price. This is just so you know how much it's actually worth. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. So your transaction that you're making in the clean price might not make the most sense because there's this accrued interest factor that's not being shown in the clean price. So this is like an extra benefit that instead of it being a binary, oh, do I have like being a question of how many interest pay coupon payments do I have left? It makes up for that difference in timing before you're gonna get it. It's a way to kind of be rewarded for someone having waited for how long it's going to take. Okay. Yeah, but why is it actually worth anything? Because, like, I understand that, you know, you're holding on to the coupon and saving somebody the wait, but why should your accrued interest be of any value? Why shouldn't it, the line just look flat and then spike at the payment date? Because if you think about it, it's the whole idea of discounting future cash flow. So you don't have to discount that as much because it's coming tomorrow instead of six months from now. Does that make sense? That's kind of how I think about it, where if I'm discounting cash flow that's due a year from now or due tomorrow, the one sure, tomorrow then, is gonna be worth more to me. Yeah, but then you wouldn't, you know, always spike up to the same coupon amount, would you? Like on this chart. Like I mean Are you saying that you're gonna be discounting it at different rates for each six month period? No, but like you discount like it's it's a heavier discount f the further down the line, right? So like, shouldn't spike up to to the same level anymore, should you? Um. So discount uh, shouldn't like each weight be a little bit lower. Yeah. So I understand what you're saying. Um. What it's doing here, and I, I didn't make the graph, but I I do completely understand what you're saying. Where this is just talking about the coupon amount at the time. This is not the discounted value of the coupon. Oh, this yeah. is the coupon amount. So the coupon amount is constant. The present value of that coupon amount, obviously two years from now, assuming you're in a positive interest rate environment, is going to be a lot lower. Yeah, yep. But this is just the actual coupon amount. The uh, the nominal, not the, I guess that wouldn't even be the right way to describe it, but this is just the actual money that you're getting on that date. So it's a time period between now and six months from now where this is going to accrue. The question is, like what is the difference in the discounting over that six month period? If you did want to say that the risk-free interest rate is going to change, obviously uh, Vasa check only tells us so much. I don't know how much that interest rate is going to change between now and then. But if you had a forecast where you said that interest rates two years from now are going to be lower across the board. So we're going to have a lower risk-free rate that we're discounting it at. So we want to discount it less then we could, you could then say that the value of the accrued interest is going to be less, if that makes sense. Sure. Okay. Awesome. So everyone's clear on this. Good to move on. All right. Cool. So to look at day count conventions, these are an absolute mess as well. But uh, pretty important, the nice thing is that when you're actually trading, you will have uh, something to look at, some reference material to actually know on the bonds for, um, I guess the reality is if you get on a desk and you're trading a specific type of bond, you're gonna be specifically trading that bond. So it won't matter too much 
but it's good to know and definitely could set you apart in an interview. With regard to treasury notes and treasury bonds, which means it's across the treasury curve, they're denoted as actual over actual, which means the number of days that have elapsed as opposed to the number of days that there actually are in that year or whatever that period is. For 30 over 360, we see that um, on corporates, munis, and that's the reason that it's on corporates is that it's a lot easier for their own accounting. And we'll also see 30 over 360 for things like euro bonds where, and, and MBS as well, where we want to have payments every month and you want everything to be one over 12. So between months, you do have that accrued interest. Um, I guess if there's not a coupon being paid, then you're gonna have that anyways. But the idea is that you are quoting it as the number of months left, not the number of days left. And there's some things where you would learn, like for money market instruments, which, are the sh which is the short end of the curve. So these are the like, very short duration securities, typically less than one year. I think different people define it differently, but less than one year. And the idea is that when you hold it for 365 days, you are gonna earn 365, uh, 365 days of interest over that, um, I'm sorry, 365 divided by 360 days of interest in the 365 day period. So it's just ways that they're denoted. It's good to know. You don't necessarily need to memorize it, but just know that these exist, know that different products work differently. Um, it does have an impact when you get into trading, especially fixed income derivatives where uh, the spreads are gonna be so small anyways. So things like this can be really important. All good? All right, moving on. Uh, corporate and sovereign credit ratings. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the different credit scales. So there are 18 different categories, I guess 19 if you want to count not rated as well, which represent the risks of holding a bond. So bonds are obviously the promise to repay. They're not, in, and obligation, but they're not um, guaranteed. They're promised, but not guaranteed. And so because of that, you do have this risk of default. So something that's AAA, like Apple, uh, last I looked, there's only two AAA companies in the US and Apple's one of them, is incredibly safe. It is AAA. We saw, I think the US government was downgraded, I guess, two years ago to AA plus as a, a very interesting move that pretty much had no effect. But the idea is they're still considered risk-free despite that. But corporates and sovereigns are rated by credit agencies. So we'll see S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. They're known as the big three. These are the important ones. In esoteric ABS, in the asset-backed securities world, you have different credit agencies that oftentimes rate different securities. So you'll have something like Kroll come in where the KBRA, the Coral Bond Rating Agency, that comes in and rates more esoteric securities. And sometimes you'll also have the um, one of the big three come in with one of the smaller agencies as well. So something like Morningstar is also one of them. But considering uh, the scale, as you would imagine, things that are closer to AAA are safer, which means they're probably gonna yield less. Obviously, every bond's different, has different characteristics in terms of convexity or callability, especially on the corporate side or non-call periods, or if we end up being in a less borrower light and uh, being in a less cuff light environment, we could see some sort of less borrower friendly terms happen, which could create more distinction there. But the whole idea is you know, the top is safe, low yield, the bottom is riskier, higher yield. Um, there's this huge concept that's incredibly imperative, I can't stress this enough, called uh, the fallen angel risk. So this big delineation occurs between this triple B minus rung with this double B plus, which is the difference between investment grade and non-investment grade. This sounds like a small difference because if I went from A plus to A, no one would really care. For investment grade mandates, it is huge. You need to be investment grade. You need to be at least, at least triple B minus or higher. So when you fall from being investment grade to being high yield, 
you are now construed as a fallen angel, which means these investment grade funds that represent huge portions of capital, huge, huge flows of funds, cannot decide to buy your security no matter how much they like it because their mandate officially pre uh, prevents them from doing so. So they are not able to buy these securities that are not triple B minus or higher. So once you fall below that, you lose huge amounts of investor capital and that's a massive issue. A company that's recently been a fallen angel, and we've seen a lot of these, especially in March and April in the early stages of the COVID crisis, is Ford. Ford, I believe in 2012, became investment grade again after the crisis, and they made a huge deal about becoming investor grade because obviously it's a cheaper cost of funds, it's a lower cost of debt, which is great, but also uh, they turned it into something more than that. They turned it into <laughs> effectively an issue of pride. So it was very important for them to be rated investment grade. They lost that status and became triple, uh, double B plus last uh, April, this, this past April, which was a big issue. Um, that should be pretty intuitive though. If anyone has any questions, please jump in. All right, moving on. So as maturity nears, we see whether the bond's trading at a premium or par, or at a premium to par or a discount, we see this price convergence, regardless of if it's at a premium before or at a discount before, it becomes close to par as maturity nears. The reason for this is at maturity, it's gonna be worth 100, unless it's called early, which would happen beforehand, but at maturity, it's gonna be worth 100, it's gonna be worth par if it survives to maturity. So we see things like in, if we're trading at a discount and we have distressed debt and then it goes deep into the distress category. So we trade, have a trading in the 40s or the 50s or Argentina touched a low in the 25s and ended up being restructured with bankruptcy notes being uh, traded around or a paper being traded around 55 was the final deal with the unsecured creditors committee. So we see that whole idea that debt can be restructured, which means that it is like called early. I don't think call is necessarily the right term, but it is taken out early because you see it not reaching maturity and not reaching par. But as we get closer to maturity, the likelihood that it's not going to make it to maturity low, uh, lowers because there's less time between that present time and maturity, if that makes sense. So as we get closer, the likelihood of survival is higher. And then when it's arrives, it's going to get pulled out of par, which is the same as saying getting pulled out of face, which is the same as saying the price is going to be 100. All right. Uh, uh, I have a question about the, yeah. the slide. Um, so the premium bond price, so the par values, the how much a bond is worth when it matures, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're buying a bond like at a premium price, wouldn't that mean that you're buying it above its value? So it's equivalent to having like negative interest basically? Yeah, so I completely understand what you're saying there. And that was definitely like my first intuition as well. But the idea of buying a bond at a premium is, I guess, a couple of things. So you think that it's going to be worth more in the future. So you think that interest rates are going to fall so that this price is going to rise. You also can think that it's going to be made whole, which means they're going to pay to call it early. So if it's a callable bond, you'll see it trading at a premium. Usually bonds are issued at discounts. So like corporate bonds are oftentimes issued at discounts for another weird reason. They like to be quoted as in terms of one eighth, which is a, a different issue. But the idea is that you'll oftentimes see corporate bonds that are issued at discounts and they won't necessarily trade above 100, not that I've seen, if they're not callable. If they are callable and will be called early, then they'll trade closer to whatever that make whole premium is, which is that price at which they're gonna be called, which is gonna be above par. Okay, so I guess like, uh, okay, so there's like on this graph, there's also like a callable price, which is above the premium price, and that's the price it will be at if it gets. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, of course. And not all balls, not all, not all bonds are callable. So there's only certain types of bonds that are callable. We'll see. I don't think I've ever seen a sovereign bond be callable. I've seen obviously uh, lots of corporate bonds are callable, and that's the easiest example to turn to. And you'll see things like mortgage-backed securities trade above par as well. 
uh, that's for a different reason. You'll see that prepayment risk, so that's why they'll trade above par, but you'll see mortgage-backed securities consistently trade. The ones that have coupons that are, uh, I guess, trading around, the mortgage-backed securities with about 3% coupons right now are gonna trade around 107. So you see them trading at a premium, a steep premium. Okay, thank you. Awesome. And then we will have a lecture soon on mortgage-backed securities and securitization. That's my personal favorite thing to read about. So I'd be very excited to have that conversation. To, was that it in terms of questions? Hopefully I didn't miss anything. Please don't hesitate to interrupt me. All right. Um, considering duration, duration is the first derivative. And there are three different ways to calculate duration that we'll get to talk about today. And the first and most intuitive way to look at it is it's the summary of the weighted average maturities of the, it's the weighted average maturities of these discounted cash flows. So the idea is that if you're going to be duration hedged, you're going to be hedged from interest rate risks. This eliminates your sensitivity to interest rates. Because of that, your duration of a zero coupon bond has a maturity T because you're not getting coupons along the way if it's a zero coupon bond. If you are getting coupons, the higher the coupon, the lower your duration because you're going to be getting more money sooner. So you're getting a higher percentage of your funds earlier in the life cycle. So your duration is going to be lower because duration is the weighted average of your payment times. When you think about Macaulay duration, think about weighted average. There's an amazing video on YouTube that explains, I think it's titled like duration for five-year-olds or something. It explains it the simplest way I've ever heard. If you picture like a yardstick, like a long ruler with little buckets of water and then all the way at the end you have this massive bucket of water which is going to be the repayment of your principal and along the way you have your little coupon payments there's a point at which you can balance the yardstick on the end of a table and have it be completely even because these two things are balanced so the idea is duration is finding that spot at which the sum of all the little things moved over to a certain point is going to be equal to the big thing and i have a graphic that should bring that imagery to life and I can provide the link to that video as well that just makes it glaringly clear. When you think Macaulay duration, Macaulay duration is in years and it's going to show the weighted average time to maturity. The longer the time that you have to maturity, the higher the duration is going to be, which makes sense because if it's the weighted average of payment times and now your payment times are going to be longer, then that's going to be higher. Considering the duration of a perpetuity, we have one plus the yield divided by the yield. So for 10%, uh, yield at 10% in a bond with a price of 100, we'll have 1.1 divided by 0.1, so we'll have, one, uh, we'll have 11. And because of that, we can glaringly see this issue or issue in perception of perpetuities have no maturity. They are perpetual securities. You will get money forever. It is perpetuitous. It does not end despite this, it still does have a duration. And this is why you cannot use Macaulay duration. Macaulay duration is a good proxy and a great way to think about it in terms of years, but there are limitations on how it can be used. On the left side of your screen, you can see a formula that walks through the calculations. I think it's a lot easier to talk it through in words and think about it that way. But for those of you that prefer formulas, it is Quant Club after all, that might be an easier way to picture it. So it's the weighted average of the the weighted average of the discounted cash flows all the way to maturity. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple more slides on duration, and then that should probably clear up any questions you guys may have as well. Talking about modifying duration, this is going to be the second type of duration that we're going to talk about. The Macaulay duration is the weighted average of the discounted cash flows in years. So you have the percentage of each cash flow that's coming in a specific time frame. So we end up with a year amount that shows how many years is the weighted average of all these payments. The modified duration measures this actual first derivative. So there's a formula on the left that will change your Macaulay duration, which is denoted by dmac, to your actual derivative. And this modified duration formula is going to come in absolute handy for the um, convexity calculations we'll do next. That'll be very, very important. With regard to 
uh, the bond price change. We see that being equal to the yield change times the modified duration plus, the, uh, I'm sorry, times the bond price. So you have the price times the change in yield times the modified duration to get you the change in a bond price for a one basis point change in uh, yield. So this will come into play as well when we consider the dollar value of an 01, the DV01 risk uh, characteristic. And these are pretty advanced genuine fixed income concepts. So please don't be hesitant to ask away. These things are very important, especially to practitioners and will come especially in handy through the interview process. So to summarize, we have Macaulay duration, which is in years and the modified duration, which is gonna come in in terms of a mathematical first derivative. Effective. Mm -hmm. Hey, sorry, jump in. Uh, uh, do you want a longer duration or a shorter duration? Uh, it depends what you want. So a longer duration means that you need to have your money out longer. A shorter duration means obviously you don't. Um, different people want different things. Different investors have different mandates. Different people are in it for different reasons. For the idea is that a lot of people are duration neutral. So they end up DVO1 hedging, which means that they are delta neutral. All these are uh, in terms of applications, synonymous terms. So when you're delta neutral, delta comes from the options world, but delta is synonymous to saying you're changing DVO1. So if you are irrespective of, I guess, hedged irrespective of movements in interest rate risk, then you are duration hedge. So usually, uh, like I would trade convexity by wanting to be long a certain factor, or I would trade uh, specific characteristics related. So say there's a corporate bond I like, but I don't want to be exposed to macro rate risk. I want to just have exposure to that uh, direct corporate bond risk. I want to focus on that company. I want to make a micro uh, stance on that company and I don't want to have that rate exposure. So I'm going to take the duration of my corporate bond and find the duration of my risk-free bond and use that to buy the corporate bond that I want to be long and then short this um, duration. So short this risk-free rate. So I'll be duration hedged. So I don't have exposure to that interest rate risk. When people do curve trades, which means you are doing a flattener or steepener on the say fives and thirties, which means you have an interest rate curve and you want to, you think it's going to get flatter and it's uh, whatever upward sloping right now because we're in a normal market condition. We see that the long end has higher rates, the short end has sh lower rates. I want to buy enough of the shorter end. I'm sorry, uh, what did I say? I'm doing a flattener. So flattener means I want to be short the long end and long the short end. So the idea is that I'm betting on this convergence here. So I'm going to long, say, five of the short end and then, long, and then short uh, one of the other one to balance that DBO one. So I am delta hedged. Does that make sense? I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Awesome. And those rates trades, whether that's a steepener or a flattener, are incredibly, incredibly popular. This is how most macro hedge funds make their trades. This is something that a lot of people use. Uh, people don't really take on duration risk. Most people, most investors will hedge out duration and do so with a curve trade like that. So to touch on the last part of duration itself, we've got the Macaulay duration and the modified duration, but this is the effective duration. This is option adjusted. So as mentioned previously, a lot of bonds are callable, which means that there is an option that they can be prepaid and they can be made whole early. So because of this option, we have effective duration, which adjusts for it. So the change in bond prices by the change in yield, when the change, uh, when the change in yield changes the cash flows. So the idea is, you might have it called early and you want to know that because if you think that it's likely that it's going to be called early, you might want to hedge your effective duration risk instead of hedging your duration because it doesn't matter what the duration is if it's not going to make it past the call date. So if something's trading way in the money and you know that it's going to be called, then you're going to trade it with your Y to C instead of your Y to M, which is your yield to call instead of your yield to maturity, and then use this infective duration as well. 
So that's where you see this effective duration equation. That's not going to be applicable for what we're going to be doing with uh, convexity, just because for simplicity. But you could just use effective duration in place of modified duration and cover the same concept there for callable ones. So this was the graphic I was uh, alluding to earlier. You see two little things and then one big thing. So put simply, you have these two little things which represent your coupon payments and this one really big circle at the end which is going to represent your principal repayment. So considering this point, this 2.94, this 2.94 is the weighted average of time to maturity. So this is going to be your Macaulay duration because if you think about this and you need to balance a balancing beam and you have these two little things and this one really big thing, you need to put this a lot closer to where the one really big thing is. And I think that's the simplest way to think of it. Obviously, because these are your cash flows that are happening in the future, you want to use the present value of these cash flows instead of, this looks like a 2% coupon, instead of using a 2%, you use this 1.96. And instead of using 2% here, this will be 1.93. Uh, the reason that this present value is going to be above 100 is that although it's being discounted, this is 100 plus 2. So this is 102 discounted at whatever the risk-free rate is as well. Um, on the left-hand uh, I've got to check. Yeah, I'm so sorry. It's 10 to the negative 4. That was uh, a mistake of mine. It's 10 to the negative 4. So that is one over 10,000, which makes a lot of sense and is why that's completely right. Um, thank you so much for pointing that out. Because if you think about 1%, 1% is negative two, and then uh, this is like 1% of 1%, so it's going to be 10 to the negative four. So let me change that before I send these out. It'll be 10 to the negative four. But Duration, does that make sense? And this right here, this dp divided by dy, uh, it should be partial derivatives, but the idea is the derivative of price with respect to yield is going to be that, uh, I'm sorry, that modified duration, not that Macaulay duration, because we need that in that relative change. All good? A lot of talking for me, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> all right. So to look to convexity, this is very interesting. So we see the slope of this tangent line is going to be modified duration. This means that derivative, like we mentioned before, obviously by the definition of what a derivative is, is that slope of the tangent line at that py point. If you look to this chart, we see that this is upward, uh, I guess, convex for lack of a better word, where there's this difference between what the um, curve is and where this tangent line approximation goes, especially the further out you get. So for small changes in yield within a relatively close area, we see that modified duration is a good head. However, when you go out longer on the curve, we see, or I guess, you can't say that because it's not a time axis, but when you go for much larger movements in yield, we see that this spread gets wider and it's going to get bigger on the upside. This is for a couple different reasons, most notably for, um, so the idea is that when yields get lower, that's going to be discounted less as well. So your yield has fallen. And the idea is that if the yield on the bond has fallen, the risk-free rate has probably also fallen, which means it's going to be discounted less. But that's not necessarily too imperative. Um, so we have this price yield curve here. This is convex up. Most famous example of something with negative convexity is a mortgage-backed security. Again, we'll touch on that in our next lecture on MBS, but the idea is that mortgage-backed securities are subject to prepayment risk because if you have a mortgage, it can be taken out of the pool of securitized mortgages early. So you have this whole idea that you might not get your full cash flow. So you have these IO and PO strips, and we'll get way into this, um, which I'm very excited for if you couldn't tell uh, a couple weeks from now. But the idea is that when you have a callable bond, you can be short convexity. If a bond is non-callable, 
then we are not short convexity. We are long convexity. One thing to note here is that this was a negative on the DVO1 side, which you should definitely watch for. It does need to be negative. And that's why you say that this is long convexity, because this is a convex line. Um, uh, also, low and no coupon bonds are going to have the highest interest rate volatility. So callable bonds that are nearing the call price are going to have negative convexity. And then when bonds have lower coupons, we're going to have this higher convexity over here. Uh, all right, I think that pretty much covers convexity. Any questions on that? This is a really important concept. So the easiest way to think about it is construing modified duration as the first derivative and considering convexity to be the second derivative. All right, well, awesome. So that pretty much covers everything that I had. This just goes through the breakdown one more time of a reminder on the three different major categories that are in fixed income. And there's a lot more to touch on as well. And obviously it's an incredibly broad space, but it's something very interesting to look into. And hopefully this served as a great introduction to some of the mathematics behind how these fixed income products actually work. If you do have any questions, please do jump on, let me know, send me a chat, send it to me directly if you don't want to uh, make it public. I have no problem doing it that way as well. Um, so please do let me know. And hopefully this was helpful. This is my first time doing a full lecture, so. I wasn't quite sure exactly what to cover. I know a lot of you guys have very different backgrounds. If you haven't, Professor Rusa used to teach, or I don't know if he's teaching in the spring or not, one of the most amazing classes, I think, at any school in the world is Mathematics of Fixed Income class, the 21378. Absolutely amazing. And are there any topics you guys want to hear about? Obviously, uh, without a doubt, I'll touch on securitized products and MBS, but is there anything else that I can cover? To me, I just find this enjoyable. A lot of people have helped me. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people have helped me along the way, and I enjoy having these conversations. So if there's anything I can do, obviously, by no means do I know everything. Uh, I don't want to come off seeming like I do, but I just enjoy learning, enjoy helping, and like looking into everything. So. All right, I'll stop this and turn off the recording.